Please welcome Billy the Phone Freak from Thunder 1035. Well, good evening. How y'all doing tonight? My friends here at Ruth Eckert Hall have written a nice script for me. So uh, Ruth Eckert Hall is now one of six theaters in the country to be nominated for Polestar's Theater of the Year. Theater Magazine. Theater, the so let's hear that. Right here in the Bay Area. There's some upcoming shows they've got. Uh, Meatloaf is going to be here on December 27th. January 9th, it's Huey Lewis and the News. The smash comedy movie Some Like It Hot will be here live at Ruth Eckert Hall on stage starring Tony Curtis. So come out here for New Year's, and he's performing here for multiple days thereafter. Uh, Jackie Mason and the Prune Danish Tour will be here on February 18th. David Crosby and Judy Collins on January 22nd. So please take a moment to turn off your cell phones and pagers. No photographs or recordings allowed tonight. Thanks for coming to Ruth Eckert Hall. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. Hey, you know something people don't talk about in public anymore? Pussy farts. <laughs> anyway. Now listen, I've been out there doing my usual thing, you know, running all around the country, city to city, town to town, theaters, concert halls, casinos, busy as a dyke in a hardware store. <laughs> all right? And as part of all that activity, as part of all of that, last year, about a year ago, I did my 12th HBO uh, comedy show in the last 25 years. <laughs> 12 out of 25. Thank you very much. Thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I try to average about 12 of them every quarter century. And I'm right on schedule. Now, the reason I mention that, reason I bring that up, is because about a little, well, a little less than half, a little less than half of the material you hear tonight, it will be stuff from that show, uh, the better things, I think, that I've kept in since that time. And the other uh, portion, slightly more than half, for those of you who aren't into the mathematical thing real deeply, <laughs> will be uh, newer material uh, that's been written and developed since that time. And I mentioned that, yeah. All right, good. See, that's why I mentioned it, because some folks like to know those things as the show's getting started. So it's about a half and half deal here. Hey, you ever notice, you ever notice up on a barn, they got a weather vane up there? And uh, by the way, I don't do transitional material. You probably picked that up right away, huh? <laughs> yeah, I just kind of go right into the next topic. And at this moment, we're on Barnes. <laughs> but you might have noticed up there on the barn, they got that weather vane, and usually it's a rooster or a cock. You know, it's the same, <laughs> same animal, isn't it? It's just a different name for it. Uh, you know why they got a cock on a weather vane? Well, it's because if they had a cunt, the wind would blow right through it. <laughs> A lot of people don't know that. That's why I travel around so much. I'm here to entertain and inform. Reminds me of something my third grade teacher said to us one day, you know? She took us all aside and she said, you show me a tropical fruit and I'll show you a cocksucker from Guatemala. No, that wasn't her. That was a guy I met in the army. I'm sorry, I always confuse those two people. 
My baby takes a morning shit. She says it keeps her really fit. She feels real good till almost ten, and then she takes a shit again. Yeah. I've been trying to work a little music into my show. People like variety. Here's a song my mother used to sing around the house. Your love ran down my leg and now you're gone. <laughs> yeah, I know, yeah. Kind of a sad song, you know. Well, she was singing it in self-defense. My father used to walk around singing, I should have fucked old what's-her-name. He liked the sentimental tunes. I wrote a sentimental song. I think the uh, title might be a little heavy-handed. We kissed and my balls exploded. What do you think, too specific? <laughs> anyway, uh, some of you know this already, but I'll tell you anyway, and that is I don't talk about myself a whole lot during my shows, you know? It's not my style. But I had an incident in traffic recently that I think I ought to tell you about. And there are a couple things about me you ought to know first. I drive kind of recklessly, I take a lot of chances, I never repair my vehicles, and I don't believe in traffic laws. <laughs> so, so, so I tend to have a kind of a, an elevated number of traffic accidents. And last week, I either ran over a sheep, or I ran over a small man wearing a sheepskin coat. And I don't know because I didn't stop. I do not stop when I have a traffic accident. Do you? Huh? Do you? No, you can't. Hey, who has time? Not me. I hit somebody. I run somebody over. I keep moving. Especially if I've injured someone. I do not get involved in that. I'm not a doctor, I've had no medical training. I'm just another guy out driving around looking for a little fun and I can't be stopping for everything. Well, let's just look at it logically. Let's be logical about it. If you do stop at the scene of an accident, all you do is add to the confusion. These people you ran over have enough troubles of their own without you stopping and making things worse. Leave these people alone. They've just been in a major traffic accident. The last thing they need is for you to stop and get out of your car and go over to the fire, because by now it is a fire, and start bothering them with a lot of stupid questions. Are you hurt? Well, of course they're hurt. Look at all the blood. You just ran over them with a ton and a half of steel. Of course they're hurt. Leave these people alone. Haven't you done enough? For once in your life, do the decent thing. Don't get involved. Well, in the first place, it's none of your business. Simple as that. The whole thing took place outside of your car. That's right. Legally speaking, legally speaking, these people you ran over were not on your property at the time you ran them over. They were standing in the street that is city property. You are not responsible. If they don't like it, let them sue the mayor. And besides, it happened back there. It's over now. Stop living in the past. Do yourself a favor, count your blessings, be glad it wasn't you. And I'll give you a practical reason not to stop. You need a practical reason? If you do stop, 
sooner or later, the police are going to show up. <laughs> Is that what you want? <laughs> huh? Waste even more of your time standing around, filling out forms, answering a lot of foolish questions, lying to the authorities? <laughs> and by the way, who are you to be taking up the valuable time of the police department? These men and women are professionals. They're supposed to be out fighting crime. Stop interfering with police work. And besides, didn't anyone else see this accident? Huh? Are you the only one who can provide information? Surely the people you ran over caught a glimpse of it at the last moment, don't you think? <laughs> so let them tell the police what happened. They're a lot closer to it than you are. There's no sense having two conflicting stories floating around about the same dumbass traffic accident. Things are bad enough. People are dead. Families have been destroyed. Time to get moving. <laughs> now, on the other hand, on the other hand, if I should be out driving around looking for a little fun and I see an accident, one that I'm not involved in, I stop immediately. <laughs> well, I want to get a good look at what's going on. I enjoy that sort of thing. Someone else is injured. I want to take a look. I am Curious George. <laughs> People don't like that, though. You know, police don't like it. They say you're rubberneck, and they say you're blocking traffic. <laughs> never mind that shit. I want to take a look. <laughs> I'm never too busy that I can't stop to enjoy someone else's suffering. <laughs> and I'll tell you something else, and you might not like this, but as far as I'm concerned, the bigger the accident, the better it is. Well, I'm looking for a little entertainment. You know my favorite accident? Two buses and a chicken truck. <laughs> Get hit by a circus train in front of a flea market. <laughs> well, I want to see something interesting. I'm looking for a neck sticking out of a gas tank. <laughs> if I'm going to take the time to stop, I expect a couple of fucking laughs. And if my car should happen to be in such a position where I can't quite see what's going on, can't get a good enough look, I'm not the least bit shy about asking the police to bring the bodies over a little closer to the car. <laughs> Pardon me, officer. Would you fellows mind dragging that twisted-looking chap over here a little closer to the car, please? My wife has never seen anyone shaped quite like that. <laughs> look at that, sugar lips. That's his rib cage sticking out of the glove compartment. Thank you, officer. That will be all now. You can throw him back on the pile. We'll be moving along. And off I go out onto the highway, looking for a little fun. Perhaps a tanker truck filled with human waste will explode in front of the Pokemon factory. <laughs> ah, thank you. I appreciate that. Reminds me of something my grandfather used to say to me, you know. He'd look at me and he'd say, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going upstairs and fuck your grandma. <laughs> well, he was just a really honest man. He wasn't going to bullshit a four-year-old. Hey, here's something you guys will recognize. You know the worst thing in the world is when you get the soft skin of your penis caught in the zipper of your pants. Ah, oh, ain't that awful goddamn. You know what's even worse? Trying to get it loose. Pulling the zipper in the opposite direction. Cause this time you gotta do it on purpose. I say, fuck it, I'll stay home today. <laughs> yeah? Ah, ah. I lock myself in the freezer, maybe the pain will pass. <laughs> Here's something you women will know about. Did you ever notice when you're blowing a horse, there's kind of a... Come on. What, you never blew a horse? You don't know what you're missing. Ah, I'm only kidding you, I never blew a horse. What do you think I am, fucking stupid? Never blew a horse. 
One time I jacked off a reindeer. <laughs> well, it was Christmas, we're both a little drunk, what the fuck? You know? Hey, how do I know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, shit. I met him on the roof. <laughs> Couple eggnogs, one thing led to another. Season's greeting. <laughs> hey, do you realize, do you realize that right this second, right now, somewhere around the world, some guy is getting ready to kill himself. Isn't that great? <sighs> Did you ever think about that kind of shit? It's true. Right this second, some guy is getting ready to bite the big bazooka. Because statistics show, statistics show that every year a million people commit suicide. A million. That's one, that's 2,800 a day. That's a lot. That's one every 30 seconds. <laughs> there goes another guy. And I say guy because men are four times more likely than women to commit suicide. Even though women attempt it more. So men are better at it. <laughs> There's something else you gals who want to be working on. If you want to be truly equal, you're going to have to start taking your own lives in greater numbers. <laughs> but I just think it's interesting to know that at any moment, the odds are good that some guy is dragging a chair across the garage floor, trying to get it right underneath that ceiling beam, wouldn't want to be too far off center. If it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. Somewhere else, another guy's going over and getting a gun out of a dresser drawer. Somebody else is opening up a brand new package of razor blades. Maybe he's struggling with the cellophane a little bit, you know? Ah, uh, shit, it's always something goddamn fucking shit. I just think that's interesting as hell. That's probably the most interesting thing you can do with your life. End it. I don't think I could do that. Could you? Ah, shit, no. I don't think I could commit suicide if my life depended on it. <laughs> but I understand it. I don't wonder why they do it. I don't wonder, well, why did he do it? And what was he thinking? Uh, you know what I wonder? Where would he find a fucking time? <laughs> Who's got time to be committing suicide? Aren't you busy? I got shit to do. <laughs> suicide would be way down on my list. Probably down past lighting my own house on fire. <laughs> I might want to try a little self-mutilation first. Take a couple of hunks out of my arm. See if I like the general idea. Cause you gotta have priorities, man. And you gotta have a plan too for something like that. People got a plan, you know, people don't just run out the house and jump off a building. There's stuff you have to decide. Timing is important, when you're gonna do it. Well, let me see now. I'm gonna kill myself, when am I gonna do this? Wednesday's out, got to take Timmy to the circus. <laughs> Survivor's on on Thursday. <laughs> Friday, got my colon cleansing. <laughs> Folks are coming over on Sunday. Sunday! <laughs> By God, that'd be just a thing. Maybe mom will find my body. Serve her right for fucking me up the way she did. And you gotta pick a method. How are you gonna do it? Well, let me see now. How am I gonna do this? Afraid of heights, that's no good. Can't swallow pills, don't like the sight of blood. Fucking oven's electric. I'd lie down in front of a train, except Amtrak ain't come through here in 30 goddamn years. Maybe I'll just take a gun and shoot myself in the mouth. I suppose I'd miss. People be laughing at me. Suppose I live. I have a big fucking hole in my head. Have to wear some kind of dumbass hat. I guess I'd just hang myself. That'd be good. 
Got to get a rope. Mm, shit, it's always something. <laughs> I got a rope in the garage. I just got a lot of grease and paint on it. Don't want to get that stuff on my neck. <laughs> Walmart's having a special on rope this weekend. No sense spending a lot of money to kill myself. Then again, I can put it on my credit card. I'll never have to pay the fucking thing. <laughs> That's it then, I'm hanging myself and Walmart's paying for it. <laughs> What's next? A note. Oh, Jesus. Gotta express myself. Hell, if I could express myself, I wouldn't be thinking about doing something like this. Where's a pen? To never find a pen. Told the kids not to move the pen away from that telephone. Goddamn kids. I ought to just kill them, too. <laughs> Make it one of them family deals. Ah, here's a pen. Well, I probably ought to just jam this fucking thing through my neck and get it over it. <laughs> Let's see now. Where do you put the date? Upper left, upper right. Jeez, shit. I can never remember that. Anyway, to whom it may concern. Ah, that's kind of impersonal. Dear Marzell. Ah, leaves that to kids. I know. Hey, guys, guess what? <laughs> Keep on reading. How are you? I hope you are fine. I am not fine. As you can no doubt tell from me lying here dead on the floor. You are the ones who drove me to this. I was doing just fine until you fuckers came along. I hope you're happy now that I'm goddamn dead. Sign the corpse on the floor. P.S. Fuck you people. That'd be a good note. All right, you all right. You are back. I don't think a writer could ever commit suicide, do you? Writer'd be too busy working on the note all goddamn year. <laughs> Trying to get it just right. Second draft, third revision, whole new ending. Finally turn it into a book proposal and have a reason to live. <laughs> that ain't no good. I just think that's kind of an interesting subject. I think suicide is interesting, you know? I think most people would agree it's a kind of interesting subject. Most folks, I think, would have a little curiosity about it. I'll bet you could have an all-suicide channel in this country. On TV, well, shit, they got all golf. What the fuck? <laughs> huh? Well, you ever look at golf? It's like watching flies fuck. <laughs> if you can get a bunch of assholes to sit still and watch that kind of bullshit, you know you can get them to watch some suicides. <laughs> all day long, 24 hours a day, nothing but suicide. One guy after another killed himself right on TV. Must die television. <laughs> You'd get a lot of people watch that shit. You'd get a lot of people volunteering to be on there just so their friends could see them on TV. People are fucking goofy. <laughs> You'd get a lot of people volunteering. You'd get all them leftover assholes from Let's Make a Deal. <laughs> oh shit, they'd be lined up around the block there putting on funny makeup and costumes and capes and shit, calling themselves Captain Suicide. You know, the guys would be competing for most unusual method. People would be jumping off of barns, lighting themselves on fire, putting rat poison on a hot dog, drinking, mopping glow. <laughs> You'd probably have some weird fuck show up who figured out how to kill himself with dental floss and a crossbow. <laughs> People are fucking goofy. I'll bet you could find a married couple in one of them trailer parks somewhere who'd be willing to sit in a love seat and blow each other's heads off with shotguns while a love song is playing. People are nuts. This country is full of nitwits and assholes. Did you ever notice that? Nitwits and assholes. Oh, shit, yeah. Oh, God. And they all vote. Yeah, they all, they're the only ones who vote. You can see that from looking at the election returns, who's doing the fucking voting. It sure ain't me out there taking part in that fucking charade. Oh, that's all who vote. And, 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 and you know those people on the Jerry Springer show? Those are the average Americans. <laughs> yeah, below average don't get on the show. 
below average is sitting home watching that shit on TV. <laughs> Waiting to go out and vote, looking at their sample ballot. People are fucking goofy. Now listen, you know, if you're gonna be on TV and you're gonna put a program on TV, you have to think about sweeps month. Sweeps months, there's more than one of them. Everybody knows about what that is now. It's those months of the year when the, the networks put on all their big stars and their biggest presentations, try and grab all the ratings so they can change their advertising rates. And you'd have to compete with that. So I think on the All Suicide Channel, you'd wanna go with mass suicides. Big fucking promotions, you know? Here's one idea. You know, we got a lot of hopeless fucks in this country. Got a lot of, oh, he has a lot of, I call them dead enders. People ain't got nothing to fucking, you know, uh, live for or nothing. Uh, there'll be a lot more of them too, by the way, as soon as the rest of this fucking depression hits for sure. Yeah, oh, Wall Street ain't went finished with you assholes. You know that, don't you? Nah, they're just waiting in the way. Give you a little breather for the holidays. They're going to come after you. Listen, they already got your fucking retirement money and your stock shit and everything. They're coming after your fucking house next. Isn't, that, isn't this housing bubble nice? Oh, low interest rates, high housing prices. Yeah, pfft, right in the fucking asshole. <laughs> Two years from now, you watch. These cocksuckers, they'll buy the country back a dime on a dollar. They do it every 30 or 40 years. Anyway, by that time, there'll be a lot of hopeless fucks. Then there'll be a lot of people walking around, bumping into each other, talking to themselves and all this kind of shit. We already got a lot of them now. First of all, you got all these homeless fucks. Then you got these people, uh, condemned prisoners and life sentence people who got no fucking future. And you got a lot of terminal patients, people who know they're gonna fucking die. And then there's these people who've been watching television, they saw a commercial that told them they were clinically depressed, so they're taking pills for that shit. And there's a lot of these hopeless fucks. I'll bet you in this country, you could get about 500 of these hopeless fucks and get them to hold hands and jump into the Grand Canyon. <laughs> I bet you, yeah, yeah, I bet you. For money, for money, oh shit, you gotta give them something. <laughs> oh, you gotta, yeah, Americans will do anything, but you gotta give them a goddamn toaster. <laughs> Put little cameras on their heads, tell them it's jump cam. <laughs> They like that shit. Maybe you can get a bunch of these Christian assholes to do it and call it Jump for Jesus. <laughs> sure. Hey, yeah. Hey, they all want to die and go see Jesus anyway. Give them a helping hand. <laughs> go on, you Christian fuck. He's at the bottom of the canyon. Go on down there. Look around for him. He's the one who's glowing. He's the glowing man. Ah, oh, they like that shit. Now listen. You'd have a lot of fun with a channel like this. And um, here's the deal, though. If you didn't want to go with uh, cable, you wanted to broaden your audience, then you got to go to the broadcast networks and you're going to look for something like Fox. This is a Fox show if I ever heard one. It's a Fox reality show. You get Budweiser to sponsor it. Budweiser and a whole lot of car companies so the kids can be thinking about drinking and driving at the same time. <laughs> That's always a good idea. And, and, uh, and naturally, if you're going to be on TV of any kind, you've got to go for that younger demographic. That's who those advertisers are looking for, 18 to 25, 18 to 31, whatever the heck it is. You know, there's all these different kind of, but they're all young. And uh, that's what you, that means you've got to get a lot of young people interested in suicide. You know how you get young people interested in suicide? You don't call it suicide. You call it extreme living. <laughs> Ah, yeah. Young people like suicide anyway. It's the third leading cause of death between 15 and 24. Did you know that? Third. It's ninth in the general population. That'll give you an idea how much they like this shit, especially these young males. These, these uh, adolescent boys, teenage boys, a lot of them kill themselves when they're jerking off. Did you ever hear about that? It's one of those things Americans don't handle too well, so we don't talk about it a whole lot. But it's out there, it's out there, and it's extremely common. It's called autoerotic asphyxiation. About a thousand of these kids die from this every year, trying to pull this off, you'll pardon the pun there. <laughs> a thousand of them die, so you can imagine how many of them are trying to do this thing. Now, here's how it works. Apparently, I never tried it, it sounded risky to me. <laughs> Jerking off is all I need, you know? I ain't trying to double my money, fuck that shit. I just jerk off, wipe off my chest, get up and go to work, you know? That's all I do. That's all I do, folks, oh yeah. Oh, sure. Nothing fancy, you know? 
But here's how this thing works. Apparently, apparently it is true that physiologically speaking, if you cut off your air supply right at the moment you're going to have an orgasm, the, the orgasm is about 900 times better. So what you got to try and do is stand up on a chair or a bucket or something, and you put a rope around your neck, and you start jerking off. And while you're pulling your pud, you got to arrange so that just before your orgasm, you almost strangle. And while all of this is going on, by the way, you got to maintain a hard on. <laughs> Which is not no easy task, because you might just be getting ready to buy the farm. So you better be fantasizing about someone you really like. Or something you really like. You know, maybe getting fucked in the ass by a game warden. I don't know what it might be. Hey, we're all different to each his own, you know? So let's recap. Stand on the chair, rope around your neck, Peter in your hand. Now you got to time it just right so that just before you come, you almost die. And sometimes you miscalculate. You don't know if you're coming or going. There ain't no way to know that shit. I know. I know. And hey, the parents of these kids are too embarrassed to tell the police, so they put the kid's dick away and say he had poor grades. <laughs> his girlfriend left him. Oh, really? Well, no wonder, lady. Look at his fucking hobbies. <laughs> then they blame it on heavy metal music. If it's suicide, they blame heavy metal. If it's murder, they blame rap. But the parents never have anything to do, to do with these bad outcomes. You ever notice that? They escape all responsibility. Parents got to be the most full of shit people in the world. <laughs> got to be full of shit, you know? Oh, yeah. Oh, hey, if a kid's a winner, I mean, if a kid's a loser, they had nothing to do with it. But if he's a winner and he's got big, good grades and he's out there getting scholarships, boy, they're the first ones out front waving their hands and taking fucking credit. I guess it's a nice state of mind if you can talk yourself into it. Anyway, these are the kind of things I think about when I'm sitting home alone and the power goes out. <laughs> these thoughts come into my head. Some of them are a little weirder than others. I acknowledge that. I was thinking about all the younger women who got buried today. Did you ever think about that? Probably not. <laughs> but I was thinking about all the younger women who died three or four days ago and got buried today. And some of them had a bad heart, you know. Some of them had a bad kidney. But a lot of them had perfectly good pussies. Good pussies, nice tits, reasonably tight assholes. Going to waste. In the ground. It just seems a shame to me that some fine young pussy should be rotting away six feet under. Because you'd think that if you can donate a heart, you know, you know, yeah, to someone who needs one, there ought to be a way to recycle some of these pussies and get them to people who need them. Some old guy living up in the mountains. Wow. Holy shit. Look at this fucking thing. God damn. Well, I thank you very much. I appreciate that, hey? Hey, this is better than Publishers Clearinghouse. <laughs> hey, hey, uh, you ain't got a redheaded one of these by any chance, do you? Oh, no, I didn't think so. I ain't never run into one of them myself. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Boy, this thing, this is the real thing, ain't it? This, I hope this ain't one of them store-bought pussies from the adult bookstore, is it? Huh? What's that? Oh, okay. Oh, Jesus. Oh, shit. Oh, no. I recognize that some bitch anywhere. That's the real thing. That's straighten out my nose hairs. I better get the hell home and get this fucker into the fucking refrigerator. The Save a Pussy Foundation. Give the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> Fuck the whales. Save the pussies. Yeah. You wouldn't want to save all of them, no. Ah, uh, some of them's wore out. You wouldn't want one of them big old rubbery things. That ain't no good, no. 
What you want is something as nice and tight and flexible. Maybe you could have an age limit or a mileage check. <laughs> you know, you figure out the average length of the average dick, the average number of thrusts per event, the average number of events per lifetime. You got that lady's mileage. <laughs> and you women, I don't want you to think we're gonna leave you out of this fun. We're gonna get you a nice set of cock and balls, okay? <laughs> yeah, we'll get you something nice just after rigor mortis has set in. Mm -hmm. You bet. Tell the truth, wouldn't you like a nice set of cock and balls without all the bullshit that usually goes with them, huh? Hey, fucking A. Goddamn right. Yes, you would. Yeah, we'll get you something nice. You keep it on the nightstand. It's real easy to find in the dark. <laughs> oh, there it is. And if your mother comes over, put a hat on it. Then I was thinking about stuff you don't want to hear, you know? There's certain things in life you don't want to hear. Like, let's say you're a young man and you got a fiance and she hasn't met your folks yet. So your folks invite the two of you over to dinner at their house Sunday evening at seven o'clock to meet your fiance. And everything's going along real nice. And halfway through dinner, your fiance stands up and says, I'll be right back. I gotta take a fucking dump. <laughs> You don't want to hear that. <laughs> Here's something you don't want to hear if you're in the hospital. Let's say you wake up in the hospital and you can't remember why you're there or how long you've been there. And you got a big bandage on your head. And the doctor comes in the room. He says, hi, Chuck, how you doing? It's me, the doctor. Yeah. Listen, here's what happened. You're in an accident and you fractured your skull. But it healed wrong. It's crooked, Chuck. Your head is crooked. Looks kind of funny. Some of the nurses were laughing at you. It's way lopsided. You look like one of them Pablo Picasso paintings. So here's what we're gonna do, Chuck. We're gonna re-break your head. Now, oh, calm down, stay in bed. Leave the tubes alone, would you please? Here's, so we're gonna re-break your head and set it correctly. Rest of the doctors will be up in a minute. There's a total of 10 of us. We got hammers, Chuck. <laughs> Big carpenter hammers. Eight of us are gonna use the hammers. The other two are gonna hold you down because we can't use an anesthetic. We wanna see your reactions. We wanna see which part of your head hurts the most when we're smashing it with eight hammers. And Chuck, there's a real good chance you'll never see again or hear or talk, dance, play sports, or recognize familiar shapes and patterns. But you will be able to gargle and whistle. So what the fuck, that's two things right there. And Chuck, while we have your head open, we're gonna fill it up with fire ants. About 3,800 of them, they've all been given PCP and amphetamines. We're trying to see how long ants can live inside a human head if they're high on speed. And Chuck, nine out of 10 people who have this operation die on the table. But don't you worry about it because we've already done nine people this year and they're all fucking dead. <laughs> so you're in the clear, you know what I mean? Try to get a little sleep before the operation. Your folks will be here in a little while. They're downtown picking out a nice casket for you. Well, I think it'd be nice to have a doctor with a little bit of emotional understanding, some empathy and, you know, sympathy for you at a time of need. Apparently, there's not as much of that in medicine as there used to be. Hey, here's something you never hear a man say. Stop sucking my dick or I'll call the police. Here's a little fun you men can have. This fun for the guys. You go in a drugstore and you pick out a big box of condoms. About, you know, 32 of them or 64, big size in them. And you go over and find a female clerk. You say, pardon me, ma'am. I wonder, would you happen to have this same item in an extra large jumbo? <laughs> kind of fat and thick, real long with maybe a bend in the middle. 
These little ones are hard to get off. They pull on my ball hairs. <laughs> Don't even bother reaching for your credit card. You're already on your way home. Now, those of you who have illegal cable hookups will know this, and that is that I, one of the things I like to do in my shows is complain. It's just a real good recurring theme with me, complaining about things. And uh, living in this fucked up country, there's no shortage of things to complain about. So this next piece of material is fairly simple. It's just called People Who Ought to Be Killed. <laughs> yep. Starting. Starting with, starting with these people who read self-help books. Why do so many people need help? Life is not that complicated. You get up, you go to work, you eat three meals, you take one good shit and you go back to bed. What's the fucking mystery? And the part I really don't understand is if you're looking for self-help, why would you read a book written by someone else? That's not self-help. That's help. There's no such thing as self-help. If you did it yourself, you didn't need help. You did it yourself. Try to pay attention to the language we've all agreed on. And a similar mystery to me, motivation tapes, motivation books, motivation seminars. Why would anyone want to be motivated by someone else? I say if you lack motivation, a seminar isn't going to help you. What you probably need is to be smashed in the head 30 or 40 times with a bowling trophy. <laughs> That'll fucking motivate you. Or at least it'll get you up and moving around the room, you know. Locate your socks, shit like that get the day moving. If you ask me, this country could use a little less motivation. The people who are motivated are the ones who are causing all the trouble. Stock swindlers, serial killers, child molesters, Christian conservatives, these people are highly motivated. They're not sitting around waiting for Tony Robbins to show up. And motivation's overrated anyway. You show me some lazy prick who's lying around all day watching game shows and stroking his penis, and I'll show you someone's not causing any fucking trouble. That's a fact. That's a goddamn fact. Here's another pack of low-grade morons who ought to be locked into portable toilets and set on fire. These are the people with bumper stickers that say, we are the proud parents of an honor student at the Franklin School or the Midvale Academy or whatever other innocent sounding name has been assigned to the indoctrination center where their child has been sent to be stripped of his individuality and turned into an obedient, soul dead conformist member of the American consumer culture. You know? I mean, God, jeez. Proud parents, what kind of empty people need to validate themselves through the achievements of their children? How'd you like to have to live with a couple of these misfits? How's that science project coming along, Justin? Fuck you, Dad. <laughs> you simple-minded prick. Mind your own business and pass the Cheerios. Here's a bumper sticker I'd like to see. We are the proud parents of a child whose self-esteem is sufficient that he doesn't need us promoting his minor scholastic achievements on the back of our car. That would be refreshing for a change, just for a change. Or, or we are the proud parents of a child who has resisted his teacher's attempts to break his spirit and bend him to the will of his corporate masters. You know, a little Marxist, but what the fuck? Hey, then you got, that. here's something realistic. We have a daughter in public school who hasn't been knocked up yet. <laughs> we have a son in public school who hasn't shot any of his classmates yet. But he does sell drugs to your honor student. <laughs> Plus, he knocked up your daughter. Then you have the people who aren't too proud of their children. What about them? We are the embarrassed parents of a cross-eyed, drooling little nitwit <laughs> who at the age of 10 not only continues to wet the bed, but also shits on the school bus. <laughs> Something like that on the back of the car might give the child a little more incentive, you know? 
get them to try a little harder next semester. Here are some more parents who ought to be beaten with heavy clubs and left bleeding in the moonlight. These are the ones who carry their babies around in these backpacks or front packs or slings or whatever these devices are called that are apparently designed to leave the parents' hands free to sort through high-end merchandise and reach for their platinum credit cards. Because it's always, always these upscale, yuppie-looking, greenpeace, environmentally conscious assholes who have them on. I say, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Natural Fibers. It's not camping equipment, it's a baby. Touch the little prick now and then. He'll thank you for it someday. You know, these are the same people who sort their garbage, jog with their dogs, and listen to Steely Dan. You know, you just want to drag them out deep into the forest and disembowel them with a wooden cooking spoon. National Public Radio people, the worst kind of humans. Here are some more people who ought to be smashed across the face repeatedly with a piece of heavy mining equipment. These grown men, grown men, who refer to their fathers as my daddy. You know, you hear a lot of this stupid shit in the South. These rebel assholes, rebel assholes. My daddy, yeah, my daddy, boy. I tell you about my daddy. You know about my daddy? Well, let me tell you. Well, you know my daddy used to say. Well, my daddy used to say. Blah 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 blah. Oh, he did, did he? Well, wasn't that fucking enlightening? You know what my daddy used to say? Fuck your daddy. Fuck your daddy. Right in his wrinkled, rustic, rural country asshole. Grow up, Billy Joe, Carl, Bob, Danny, Frank. <laughs> You're not six anymore. Closer to nine now. And a few more unfortunate mutants who ought to be penciled in for a sudden visit from the angel of death. These guys, these guys who can't tell you about a phone call they had without giving you this shit. the fucking pinky and the thumb. Like they attended mime college. Studied under Marcel Marceau. So I call her up, you know? And I'm talking to her. And she fucking hangs up on me. So I hang up on her. Then she calls me back. I fucking hang up again. I say, hey Bruno, thanks for the visual aid. But we all understand the concept of the telephone. You hold it in your hand, you talk into it. Excuse me, Bruno, incoming call. Oh, hey, it's for you. And a few more pus-headed telephone cretins. These self-important techno dicks who walk around wearing these hands-free telephone earpieces or headsets. You know, Mr. Self-Important doesn't want to be too far from the phone in case Henry Kissinger calls. He's got the Dalai Lama on call waiting. I say, hey, spaceman. As long as your hands are free, reach over here and fondle my balls, would you please? Huh? Come on. Come on. Come on. Mr. Early Adopter, I need this guy like I need a third asshole. <laughs> and answering machines. Answering machines starting with these people who think it's cute to let their children record the outgoing message. <laughs> and you can't understand a word of it because the kid's a fucking imbecile. My name is Stacy. I'm five years old. My mommy and daddy are at home. I'm a Here's my message, Stacy. I'm coming over to your house with a big knife. And I'm going to kill mommy and daddy. Then I'm going to peel off their skin and make a funny hat. 
After that, I'm going to take out my huge ding dong and stick it right in your. These are the same people, same ones who at Christmas time send you pictures of their children. Pictures you didn't ask for and you don't want. But it is fun throwing the pictures away, isn't it? I don't even look at the fucking Christmas cards. Who's this? Luann is 12 this year. Fuck Luann. I give a shit how old she is. Does she have any tits yet? Send me a picture of Luann's tits. Then I know I'm gonna have a happy new year too. And then, just to compound your holiday pleasure, they enclose a family newsletter. Just what you're hoping for. News about losers. We're so proud of Brad, he's been accepted into dental school. Yeah, in the Philippines. After four tries. Fuck Brad and everybody who looks like Brad. Judging from his picture, I think he's jerking off too much. Keep him away from Luann. Here are some more people who, well, ought to be strapped into chairs and beaten with hammers. People who wear visors. What the fuck is the point in wearing half a hat? Either get a hat or don't. No one's interested in the top of your head. Go back to the store, tell them to give you the rest of the hat. They cheated you. Better still get yourself one of them little Jewish hats and sew it to your visor. <laughs> then you got yourself a full-fledged fucking hat, my friend. And a few more musical vermin whose mothers we wish had had medical plans that included abortion. <laughs> these singers, these singers who think they're so special they only need one name. Bono, Sting, Jewel, Tiffany, Prince. What a crock of shit. Get a fucking last name, would you please? <laughs> yeah. You're so special. I got a nice two-word name for you. Pretentious cocksucker. <laughs> How you like that? Bono, Sting. It's not bad enough these assholes' music sucks, but with no last name, you can't find out where they live to throw a fucking bomb through their window, you know? <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah. Well, it's frustrating if you care about music. Here are some more people who deserve an inoperable tumor at the base of their spines. <laughs> these guys who fly around the world in a fucking balloon. What is this, 1850? Get a fucking airline ticket, would you please? When are the media gonna realize no one's interested in some rich trouser stain who's so bored he has to fly around the balloon all the time? I hope the next guy gets hit by lightning and flies around in little fart circles. <laughs> and lands in a sewage treatment pond. <laughs> and sinks with the rest of the turds. <laughs> Mr. Lighter Than Air. Here's another pack of jack-offs who ought to be strangled in front of their children. People who pay for inexpensive items with a credit card. Folks, take my word for this. Raisinets is not a major purchase. Get some fucking cash together. No one should be paying a bank 18% interest on Tic Tacs. And you're holding up the fucking line, too. Some dorky looking prick with a fanny pack waiting to be approved for a bag of cheese doodles.
I need this shit like I need an infected scrotum. Find some money. Next guy ahead of me online pays for Newsweek with a credit card is getting stabbed in the eyes. <laughs> right, the fucking eyes. And I'm getting pretty sick of guys named Todd. You know, it's just a goofy fucking name. It's goofy. Hi, what's your name? Todd. I'm Todd. And this is Scott. And Blake and Blair and Blaine and Brent. Where are all these goofy fucking boys' names coming from? Taylor, Tyler, Jordan, Flynn. These are not real names. You want to hear a real name? Eddie. Eddie's a real name. Whatever happened to Eddie, he was here a minute ago. Joey and Jackie and Johnny and Phil, Bobby and Tommy and Danny and Bill. What happened? Todd and Cody and Dylan and Cameron and Tucker. Hi, Tucker. I'm Todd. Hi, Todd. I'm Tucker. Fuck Tucker, Tucker sucks. And fuck Tucker's friend, Kyle. There's another soft name for a boy, Kyle. Soft names make soft people. I'll bet you anything that 10 times out of 10, Vinny, Nikki, and Tony will beat the shit out of Todd, Scott, and Kyle any fucking day. Any fucking day. You betcha. You betcha. Here are some more people with missing chromosomes who ought to be thrown screaming from a helicopter. Gun enthusiasts. You know, don't you just love this self-description? This is what they call themselves. I'm a gun enthusiast. Oh, yeah? Well, I'm a blowjob enthusiast. You want to see me shoot? <laughs> Cock this and I'll discharge a load for you. <laughs> and I'm not against guns. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not one of those mindless Hollywood cocksuckers. I'm not against guns. I'm not against bullets. I'm not even against people shooting each other. <laughs> you know, shooting someone is part of the American dream. I don't care who it is. Parents, teachers, kids, fuck them. Let them get shot. Doesn't disturb me in the least. But speaking of mindless Hollywood cocksuckers, before Charlton Heston became president of these dickless lunatics in the NRA, they had a different guy. He's still one of their major spokesmen. His name is Wayne LaPierre. Oh, uh, what kind of a name for a gun nut? Is Wayne LaPierre. Doesn't this sound a little fruity to you? <laughs> Hi, I'm Wayne. I'm a gun person. Bang, bang. <laughs> you know what this prick's name ought to be? Biff Webster. <laughs> Spud Crowley. A man's name, Chuck Steak. <laughs> Wayne LaPierre is just embarrassing. But I guess we ought to get used to it. It's probably going to be heard a whole lot more now that Charlton Heston thinks he's a fucking cauliflower. <laughs> he doesn't have far to travel, does he? Here are some more men who ought to be strapped to a gurney and castrated with fishing knives. White guys who shave their heads completely bald. You know... Yeah, they're so ashamed they lost 11 hairs. They're going to try to turn it into some kind of a masculine statement. I say, hey, you goofy-looking, baldy-headed fuck. <laughs> Looks good on black guys. On you, it's ugly, repulsive, and disgusting. You want to be bald? Do what I did. Wait a while. Meantime, there's no excuse for running around looking like a freshly circumcised dick. <laughs> and just to kind of wind up this little uh, litany of complaining, this is about some social criminals. These people in the space program, nassholes I call them. <laughs> in case you haven't heard, 
the latest disaster for the rest of the universe is that the United States is going to go to Mars. Okay? Oh, yeah. Oh, we're going to go to Mars, and, and then we're going to colonize deep space with our microwave hot dogs and plastic vomit, fake dog shit, cinnamon dental floss, lemon-scented toilet paper, edible women's panties, sneakers with lights in the heels, and all these other impressive things we've done down here. But let me ask you this. What are we going to tell the Intergalactic Council of Ministers the first time one of our teenage mothers throws her newborn baby into a dumpster? Huh? How are we going to explain that to the space people? How are we going to tell them our ambassador was late for the meeting because his breakfast was cold and he had to spend half an hour punching his wife around the kitchen? And what are they going to think when they hear it's just a local custom that over 80 million women in the third world have had their clitorises forcibly removed to reduce their sexual pleasure so they won't cheat on their husbands? Can't you just sense how eager the rest of the universe is for us to show up? Can't you see them out there? Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Hey, son, you know something bothers me? When I'm flying first class and some guy from coach comes up and takes a shit in our bathroom. <laughs> you know, I say, get back to your filthy coach toilet with the tampon sticking out of the commode. <laughs> Don't be coming up here trying to upgrade your feces. <laughs> your super saver feces. Well, I think most people know by now, caviar feces smell much nicer than bologna sandwich feces. It's unfortunate, it's not nice to say, you don't like to point out class distinctions, but it's a fact. It's a function of socioeconomics. It's called the fecal differential. It has to do with diet as it relates to income. The lower the income, the worse the diet, the more disgusting the feces. And the same thing is true of farts. And the worst farts of all, the most horrifying farts in the entire travel experience can be found in the economy section of any plane coming in from the third world. It is fucking torture back there. Underdeveloped country farts. Those people have farts that could kill cancer. The kind of fart that comes in handy if you have something that needs welding. The kind of fart that if you let one go at home, 30 minutes later, your plants are all yellow. The kind of fart that after two or three days, you begin to realize there are no more birds in your neighborhood. A fart that would eat the stitching out of Levi's. Can I get away with one more fart joke here? All right. The kind of fart whereby the Centers for Disease Control declares your pants a level five biohazard. And what happens? What happens? What happens on these third world airplanes is that in the economy section, about an hour after the meal service, they quite often have these life-threatening fart emergencies. The FAA calls them TFIs, toxic flatulence incidents. The airlines call them code browns. Just as a hospital has a code blue, they have code brown, code brown. <laughs> If you ever hear that sound, do not inhale. You are in a code brown. And the worst place to be, the most, the most dangerous part of the aircraft during a code brown is in the last three rows. Because what happens is, and this is simple physics, these planes get flying so fast that all of the most vicious, lethal, volatile, flammable, unstable farts get pushed toward the back of the airplane where they become compressed and they build up pressure. And they build and they build until they reach critical fart density. <laughs> CFD. And they continue to build throughout the entire flight until finally some kid turns on a Game Boy and boom! The whole back end of the plane blows off. And you know who gets blamed? Osama bin Laden. These poor terrorists get blamed for explosions that are nothing more than spontaneous, random, intermittent cabbage fart detonations. And the FBI doesn't know this, a pack of fucking nitwits you have protecting you. They're looking for explosives. They should be looking for minute traces of rice and bok choy. <laughs> These are the kind of thoughts that kept me out of the really good schools. 
and prevented me from moving swiftly up the corporate ladder. Because I was always complaining about something, you know? Always finding fault. You know something else I'm getting tired of? Songs. There's too many fucking songs. Jeez, that's all you ever hear is a song. You know how many songs there are? Well, every year 25,000 CDs come out. 25,000. So even if you threw out half of the titles and said, well, they're old songs being re-recorded, and you stayed real conservative, and you said, well, maybe eight songs to a CD, that would still be 100,000 new songs every year. 100,000, one year, that's all, and that's just this country. There's 185 other countries out there, all of them pumping out songs. Probably not a lot of snappy tunes coming out of Afghanistan these days. But some, there's got to be some. I'm telling you, it adds up. I'll bet you if there was a way you could do it, and you could count every song that's ever been written in the history of the world, in every culture, by now, there's got to be 15 million songs. Easy. Got to be 15 million. Isn't that enough? <laughs> Don't we have enough fucking songs for you people? Are you telling me you're standing in the shower and with 15 million songs floating around out there, you can't think of something to sing? You gotta have a brand new song. And they're always love songs. That's all you ever hear is these goddamn love songs. Can't somebody write a song about something else? Everything's a broken heart. Broken heart, broken heart. Fuck that, what about a fractured cheekbone? Or a punctured lung? Huh? Wouldn't you like to see some good-looking chick with big tits and long hair stand up on stage belting out a song about a punctured lung? Would sure make my fucking weekend. No one is writing these songs. How about a song about a fire in a daycare center? All right, a nursing home. Okay, a church. A crowded fucking church. How about a song about a guy who gets his legs caught in a wood chipper? Oh, you're sensitive. Here's a nice one. Family of four comes home from vacation at Disney World and finds 27 bodies decomposing in the living room. And they all have on Santa Claus suits. I'm telling you, I think we're passing up a lot of really good topics that would make terrific fucking songs. Like cancer. I know it's touchy. Fuck you. Cancer would make a really great song. Shit, everybody's got cancer. Nobody's singing about it. This is a market niche being completely overlooked. And by the way, tuberculosis is coming back. Huh? Here's another musical opportunity. Wouldn't you like to hear a song with a whole lot of coughing in it? You never hear that. All you hear is these love songs, emotional pain. You know something, the last thing I'm interested in is someone else's emotional pain. Don't be singing about your pain. Unless it's cancer pain. <laughs> then you can sing about it all you want. In fact, you can scream about it for all I care. That's not a bad idea. How about a nice three minute song of some guy screaming with cancer pain? I know it's touchy. Blow me. <laughs> it will make a terrific fucking song. And in this sick, twisted, corrupt culture, it will be the number one song of the year, I'll guarantee that. That's all you'd ever hear on the radio for six or eight months. And that's just one cut you could do a whole CD. Disease is on parade. First cut, cancer. Second cut, tuberculosis. Three and a half minutes of solid coughing. And you structure it like a real song. Starts off slow with the introduction. Guy's just clearing his throat. And you get to the first verse. <laughs> kind of a dry cough, non-productive. And you get to the second verse, the song begins to build, and you get to the chorus, and the guy's coughing louder and louder and harder and harder, and he's choking and wheezing and gasping and panting, and you can hear the fluids in his lungs, and now he's doubled over trying to catch his breath, and finally he goes into one big, huge, uncontrollable, spasmodic coughing fit, and he pukes all over the microphone. <laughs> that would be the climax to the song. And maybe you could even make it interactive with a CD-ROM, and the guy could puke right in your living room. Yeah, you'd probably need special speakers for that. I don't know, I'm not into the technical stuff. I'm more of an idea man. I'm a concept guy. You know what I am? I'm a visionary. I'm a fucking visionary. I'm always thinking. I'm always fucking thinking. Especially when I'm alone. Now, you're probably saying to yourself, what the fuck does this guy think about when he's alone? If this is the shit he's willing to say in public, 
What kind of garbage floats through this asshole's mind at home? Well, I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna tell you. You asked. I'm gonna tell you. You know what I think about when I'm alone? The first enema. Huh? Yeah, that's right. The first enema. I don't think about it all the time, you know. But a lot. Maybe 30, 40 times a day. That's not too much, is it? I don't dwell on it. It's just a quick thought. But let me ask you this. Did you ever think about that? Huh? Did you ever think about the first enema? No. You know why? No vision. No fucking vision. Me, I'm always thinking. I'm always thinking. And one time I thought about the first enema. Here's the way it happened. One day, me and my friend were giving each other an enema, okay? What? He's my friend. Leon. Hey, what are friends for? If you can't give each other the occasional enema. So me and Leon are giving each other enemas, and at this particular time, it was my turn. So I'm kind of relaxed. I'm draped over the end of the living room couch, and I'm reading the food section of the newspaper. Always looking for a good veal recipe. And me and Leon are talking back and forth. You know, we're talking about everything. We're talking about hockey. We're talking about the NASDAQ. We're talking about how sometimes if you rub your eyes real hard, you can see kind of a checkerboard pattern. And we're talking away, we're talking away. And suddenly, suddenly, out of the blue, out of the blue, I turned to Leon. Well, I couldn't turn around all the way. But kind of over my shoulder, I says, hey, Leon, I wonder whoever came up with the first enema. Well, he flipped. He practically dropped the equipment he was holding. And that thing is heavy. It's a fire hose. <laughs> Number 12 with a zoom nozzle. But it leaves you feeling really refreshed. So me and Leon spent the rest of the time talking about the first enema. Because here's the interesting part. There had to be a first one. Had to be. Everything has to happen once for the first time. Some guy, eh? some guy. Oh just sitting there had to think of the enema and I'm sure it was a guy this does not sound like a lady's idea some guy long time ago too he's probably carving spear tips that day maybe he's making a little fertility fetish for his girlfriend Suddenly, he thinks to himself, I think it would be a really great idea if I would squirt a whole bunch of water up my ass. And then just let it all run out on the rocks. I'll bet I would feel a whole lot better if I did that. And then, and then, after he thought of it, dig this, after he thought of it, then, he had to explain it to the rest of the village and test it. An idea like that, you're gonna wanna test. And you probably wanna test it on someone else, I'm sure you wouldn't try it on yourself. And wouldn't you have to be subtle? Don't you think you need kind of a subtle approach? Hey Joey, turn around, I got a surprise for you. <laughs> Whoops, I dropped my rock, would you pick it up for me please? Okay, hold still Joey. <laughs> it's okay, it's all right, all right, now just breathe, breathe in and out, breathe in and out, breathe in. No, through your mouth, Joey, through your fucking mouth, will you? Jesus Christ. It's okay, Joey. It's a new thing. It's called the enema. I thought it up today during lunch. Yeah, I had the veal. Joey, tell the truth. Did you like it a little bit? I kind of got a kick out of it myself. You want to go again? Ah, I don't blame you. That was pineapple juice. And sand. Joey, guess what? We're engaged. <laughs> I'm only kidding you. Look, I'm going home, wash off my legs. I'll see you at the dance. <laughs> Some guy had to think of that. Some guy. How? Why? Why would it even enter your fucking mind? I'll tell you why. Because the guy was thinking big. He was a visionary. Probably made a fortune. It's a big business now. They call it colonic irrigation. Oh, it's big in California, all over California, people squirting something up somebody's ass. 
and getting paid for it. Know what I'm waiting for? Enemas online. <laughs> Electronic digital enemas. E.nema.com. <laughs> They'll have them. You watch. Some guy's home tonight trying to get a mouse up his ass. You want? <laughs> Probably a Macintosh guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because we're always fucking thinking. We're always ahead of the curve. Good ideas. That's what this country's based on. Good ideas. I got a lot of good ideas. You probably picked that up right away. Good fucking ideas. I don't tell them to anybody. Here's one. <laughs> Scrabble for dummies. You don't have to use real words, and they don't have to be spelled correctly. <laughs> yeah? yeah? Everybody wins. No more losers. Just like school. Nobody loses in school now. You know, kids are too fragile to be told they've lost. So now they play musical chairs. They got nine chairs. They got nine kids. It's fucking pathetic, ain't it? I got a lot of good ideas. I'm going to open up an adult donut shop. Adult donuts. The donuts are the same, but the holes have hair on them. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. People would like that. The police would never leave the parking lot. Right next to the donut shop, I'm going to have a hot dog stand for Gentiles. Hot dogs with foreskins. Huh? Yeah. Well, think about it. The Jewish guys have those kosher hot dogs. They're kind of plain looking, you know? These would have nice little foreskins hanging off the end. And maybe you could even sell the foreskins separately. Separate item, bucket of foreskins. Give me a bucket of ten and a box of donut holes. And you go home and watch the playoffs. Good fucking ideas. I'm gonna open up a pool hall. You know what I'm gonna call it? Quit breaking my balls. <laughs> huh? Yeah, yeah, I know. Oh, well, you gotta have a catchy name. Brand names are important, and, and brand names have changed a lot, you notice? Used to be simpler, Johnson & Johnson, Smith Brothers. Now you got things like, I can't believe it's not butter. And even they have something new coming out, it's called, I sure hope the fuck this ain't lard. <laughs> There's also a new instant soup on the market. It's called Make It Yourself, you lazy prick. <laughs> Names interest me. I'm thinking of moving to Nevada where prostitution is legal and opening a bed and breakfast called the Cock and Muffin. <laughs> huh? Would you go there? You come there, I'll guarantee you that. And uh, thanks for coming here tonight. I appreciate that very much. Thank you, everybody, very, very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you.